Hey, hello, and welcome to The Whole Loaf, a holistic approach to building strong lives and healthy relationships. My name is Paul Bertsloff. I am here with my wife, Suzanne, and with Deborah Murray, author of 17 cookbooks and food stylist to the stars. And uh, this is going to be kind of our Easter special here, right? right so we're going to be talking about some maybe non-traditional Easter uh, dinners. Right. I, I know a lot of people prepare ham, and right. I like ham. I really do. I like ham. Like like My wife, ham. not so much. Yes. And so, what are some alternative dinners for Easter that you can celebrate Easter with? And so, I know you've got a turkey brining right here. Okay. Yep. So, do you know what brining is? You want to tell us what brining is? Well, brining, Paul, is a. It's actually a scientific term where we're taking liquid with salt and sugar in it and osmosis is taking place. The cells inside the turkey are going to take and hold the salt molecule which will retain water when we roast the turkey. So instead of having a dried turkey or dried poultry or pork by the process of brining for 6 to 12 hours it makes it much more juicy, much more flavorful. Right. Something they came up with in Cornell University and now Everyone is using uh, it. Cornell them. Ivy League. Yes. <laughs> so, so this is just water? And it's what salt, water, salt, brown sugar. I'm posting the recipe. Okay. I put peppercorns in mine just for a little heat. And then in the fall, I use apple cider instead of using water. Oh, yeah. And it really, in and, and the end result, when we go and carve our turkey today, yeah. I'm going to encrust it with like a brown sugar, similar to like what you okay. did with the corned beef, beef yep. and it'll have a very sweet with heat and saltiness similar to the pork or the ham, only it's less calories, it's very beautiful, great flavor, it's a great way to change up your holiday and make it yeah. healthier. Fantastic, so like I said, the recipe is online, and uh, how long do you brine it for? You All right, so hours? 6 to 12 hours okay. is ideal, anything more than 24 hours, will, you will not gain anything. Mm -hmm. Once it's done brining, what you do is you just put it in your roasting pan. Roasting pan, you're going to put it in a three, I did a netted turkey breast. You can buy them netted, you can do them yourself. You can even do the same thing with the bone in. I just find it Easter, it's nicer, it's all thin it's sliced. Thin. You can put them out with those little Hawaiian rolls. I'm going to pop this in the oven. I have a done one and we'll show you that in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so I love the science behind it right there as well. You know, Easter, all right, I, I, want, I want you to put on your thinking caps here a little bit, okay? I'm going to challenge maybe just the way that you think a little bit. You know, Easter, if you really think about it, it is a big deal. Easter, if it's true, it is game on for all things Christian. Everything hinges on Easter. If it's not true, well then it's April Fool's joke and the joke is on you. And uh, so I just want to kind of give you some facts. I want to give you maybe even a little bit of science and a little history behind Easter. And so what are we doing here? You've got more science. More, more science, science uh -huh. is going on. So this is a really simple, easy recipe and really good for you. Um, something a little different with cauliflower. So all I put into this pot here was with a boil of water, I'm going to put some turmeric and salt. That's it. Look at the great color. And then put the entire head of cauliflower in here. And it's just going to pick up all of that beautiful um, color of the turmeric. And it's going to be good for you because turmeric, didn't your doctor just put yeah, turmeric? Yeah, for inflammation. Yes, inflammation. exactly. And, and yeah, turmeric is the new thing. I mean, there's like turmeric coffees right now, yep. and uh, the turmeric is all over the place. Right. There. And it is, I, I like it. It's a delicious spice. It's a delicious yeah. spice. Really but is. by putting it into that cauliflower like that, now cauliflower is not even as nutritious as it always was. It yeah. becomes super nutritious. That's very great. Yeah, very good. Great? See, so this is going to sit here for 20 minutes. I turned off the heat. And then after 20 minutes, we're going to cut it up and then we're going to put it in the, um, the air fryer. Really, really easy. So I have three ingredients, salt, turmeric, and cauliflower. Easy. And water. Don't and water. <laughs> so I, I love all the science going on here, right? I mean, I just love it all. Because when Jesus was crucified, okay, everybody would assume he would stay dead, right? Right, right? I mean, nobody expected him to come back to life. There was no countdown on that first Easter They weren't sitting out there no. waiting for the... No, they, 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 weren't, they weren't waiting to have breakfast with Jesus. Yeah. They were not standing outside the tomb at 10, 9, 8, 7. <laughs> I mean, the disciples, nobody expected, nobody. All right? I mean, so they expected that the dead man would stay dead. Right. And when they did see the empty tomb, you know, their first inclination was not, he's alive, he's alive. When they saw the empty tomb, they wondered who stole the body. Who stole the body? Right? So once again, nobody expected a resurrection. St. Paul, I love St. Paul. Alright, in St. Paul, he wrote a letter, 
it was his first letter to this little church, this little church in Corinth, which is modern day Greece. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 7, this is what Paul says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel. Okay, you know, it's that, that you hear that a lot in church, right. gospel. And, and now Paul's going to explain to us what the gospel is. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I, pro I preached. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And Paul goes on to say, for what I received, I pass on to you as the first importance. And Paul's saying this is the most important thing. This is the number one thing that you need to remember. This is the primary thing. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he paid the debt that we owed. That he was buried. And that on the third day he was raised according to the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Okay, so I mean, Paul said that he, was, that he died. And that he was buried because that's what you do with somebody who dies, right? right? You bury them. And that, uh, but that on the third day he rose again, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time. I didn't know that. Most of whom are still living. Now, I, mean, I love that statement by Paul. Right. When Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he's saying, these eyewitnesses, they're still alive. And so Paul it. saying, yeah, I double dog dare you. I mean, go ahead and fact check me. Yeah. Paul saying, I know what I'm saying doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. And I know there's a lot of skeptics out there. I know there's a lot of people that aren't going to believe what I'm saying. So you can double check me. You can go back because these eyewitnesses, they are still alive. Okay. And that, um, though some of them have fallen asleep. He said, so most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And I just want to stop there. What does that mean? Yeah. I love that. I, I absolutely love it. In the New Testament. So the New Testament was written in Greek. In the New Testament, there's two different words for death. Okay, one, they, they just died. They're gone. Okay, they're dead. Right. And the other one is fallen asleep. Whenever someone is a believer in Christ, the scripture says they fell asleep. I mean, I just love the picture that paints because when you sleep, what happens? Sooner or later, you wake, you up. wake up. Yeah, mm -hmm. you wake up. And, and so it's, it's temporary. Then he appeared to James, then to all the other people. You know, so, I, mean, I love that statement from Paul. Just seven verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, the primary argument uh, against the legitimacy of Christianity is the resurrection, right? I mean, you may have heard it when you were in college, or you know, you may have heard somebody make a statement that Christianity is, or that the resurrection is just a myth, that the resurrection is not true, that the resurrection is a project, uh, a, a product of oral transmission, and that what that means is that you know. People started telling a story. You know, some 2,000 years ago, way back in the first century, people started telling a story. And the story started growing, becoming more and more grand. And ultimately, it became something that never took place, something that Jesus never wanted to be taught. And, and that just this, that, that resurrection became part of this oral transmission. And, and then other people would say, yeah, in the written accounts, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they'll say that the written accounts of the resurrection, well, they were way too far removed from the actual event. And they'll say that they were written decades and decades and decades after the resurrection actually took place. And so you can't, you can't count on them as right. being reliable, right? Mm -hmm. And so the primary argument against Christianity, Christianity is the resurrection, okay? And so what I love about St. Paul, okay, is that the, um, no reputable scholar, nobody out there ever questioned Paul, okay? Wow. Whether you're a believer or whether you're an atheist, Paul is not contested, right. okay? People will say that they recognize the truth that Paul was there, that he did these three missionary journeys around the Mediterranean basin, that he planted churches all throughout Asia Minor and even in Europe as far um, west as uh, Rome itself, okay? That he was this great person of influence and that he was very influential. You know, Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. He is. Yeah, I know. He wrote half of the New <laughs> There's 27 books in the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 books of those 27 letters. And actually, it wasn't books, they were letters. Um, he wrote them to individual churches, okay? And, and Paul wrote those letters in the 50s and the 60s, not the 1950s, you know, <laughs> and all those guys. I mean, the, and actual, the, real 50s, things, the actual 50s and the actual 60s AD. I bet he would have liked that. Yeah, uh, you know, you think he would have liked that? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, actually, in the 50s and the 60s AD. And I have a timeline I want to share with you in just a few minutes, but what are we doing here? 
I, this looks well, actually delicious. I am so sticky, it's not even funny, and I can't seem to get my fingers clean. So I am making mini trifles, and I'm going to make one in a cute little wine, um, a champagne glass, and then um, a larger wine glass. So what I'm using here is um, angel food cake, which is very um, low in calories. Angel food cake for about a slice is about 130 calories, where a regular slice of cake would be about 350 calories without icing. The icing is the best part. So this is something that's going to be if you're trying to count calories. So what makes it so fluffy is it, you don't use egg, egg yolks and you don't use, I just well, lost it, and you don't use butter. Right. So that's what's going to make it, it's the egg whites that's going to make it really fluffy. So what is in there is those sugar and flour. So what I'm doing is I'm just assembling this and the easiest part here is you're just going to make jello pudding just like it says on the container here which is going to be two cups of milk you can use almond milk regular milk whatever you want the um, instant pudding after it sets up you're going to add a half a thing of cool whip and all i'm doing is just assembling and it's super easy and you that's what they sent i yeah. like that it's uh, i like that they're individual servings instead of that big dish since the pandemic yes. i think we should think more about individual oh, yeah. servings right. instead of people sharing that spoon and then know? the the first time someone actually dips into it, it's not, it's not pretty, pretty anymore. anymore. Yeah. Now he said this was pretty, and I'm really I surprised think it's, because it was pretty. you, because it's not chocolate. Yeah. So let's see what he thinks later. I think he's gonna like it. See, I was just chastised before I even did anything. I was, just, <laughs> I was just about ready to dip into the pudding over here when I saw no, it. No, we're not ready yet. And then they they stopped me right. So I see you making eggs over here. Okay. So yes. well, Paul, I mean for Easter, let's face it, everyone's gonna color some eggs, right? Yep. So right. what are you gonna do with those eggs? Well, right. one of the things that I did out front is I made Josephine's Easter bread, and I'm gonna post that recipe because she's Italian. And she's very Christian, and this is a very, it's a ritual okay. that she performs every okay. single solitary Easter. She yes, makes the hollow dough, she pops the little eggs in there, and they bake them in the oven. And of course, when the eggs have color on them, it yep. makes it very pretty. very pretty. And then we're going to serve it with our turkey, our turkey sandwiches. But for the rest of us, say you're having your colored Easter eggs out, what you can do with them is actually turn them into oh, my favorite. I love these. Um, I can't even think what they're called. Devil eggs. Devil eggs. So, oh, we're talking about the devil, too. Yeah, These are, um, but <laughs> what I've done with mine is I put butter in them. So they really have a different taste and a little bit oh, wow. sauce to them. Okay. Then I've topped them with um, smoked salmon. Ooh, and that's a, delicious. Do you want to try it? I know you hate eggs. He hates, want, okay. I love, you want to try it. I think this is a really good no, 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 But that can have chance. caviar on top. I could have lump crab. I've actually had parties where you put the deviled eggs out and you put out all the different toppings, like little jerkins and little olives. And it's, it's a beautiful. dainty little thing. Isn't that beautiful? You can do the same thing with ice cream, too, I think. Mean. Yeah. You can put the ice cream out, <laughs> you know, all the toppings out. It doesn't always have to be anyway. There you go. But get that out of an egg. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. yeah, I'm not I'm not an egg kind of guy. You're no, just speaking of like, well, you know, okay, so why did the Easter egg hide? Anybody know? No, oh, no. He was a little chicken. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I know. I'm... I need to write these yeah, down. I, know. I, know. I can recall them. They're so cute. So just to kind of give you a timeline, okay? We're talking about Paul in Paul's letter to the, uh, the church in Corinth, okay? So think about this. Now, our calendar is messed up a little bit, okay? So Jesus, scholars say Jesus died somewhere around 30 or 32 AD, right? Is when Jesus was crucified, and three days later, he rose again from the dead, mm -hmm. right? So Paul wrote his letter to the church in Corinth in 55 AD, all right? So he wrote the letter to, to the church in Corinth in 55 AD. But what's interesting is Paul visited the church before he wrote the letter. Right. Okay, he visited the church in 52 AD. Okay, that's why when you like read the letter, there's all kinds of, it's past tense. Right. Okay, Paul says, for what I received, right? For what I received, so I got this in the past, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Okay, and so he, it's, it's past tense. So Paul, he actually visited church in Corinth in 52, then he wrote the letter in 55. So when you really think about it, okay, when Paul wrote, yes, so when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, okay, it was only 20 years after the resurrection. Okay, so he's, he's out, he's, he's performing these, uh, these evangelistic yeah. events, yeah. right? And it's only 20 years after the resurrection, which I, I really find amazing. Paul was a contemporary of Jesus. Paul lived 
at the same time that Jesus lived. And when Jesus was being crucified, now we don't know where Paul was at, but at that point, Paul was persecuting the Christian church. Paul's goal was to wipe the name of Christian, the, the, the name of Jesus, off the face of the earth. And so we don't know where he was at, but at the same time Jesus was being crucified, Paul was out there trying to wipe the, the Christian church off the face of the earth. Um, and it was somewhere between four months and four years, we're not really sure, but four months to four years after the resurrection that the Paul was, um, was converted, okay, that Paul had that experience on the road to Damascus, and he came to faith. And then Paul's entire life changed. So we also know that Paul went to Cyprus in 44 AD. 44 AD, Paul was preaching a gospel of the resurrection of Jesus. That's just 12 years mm. after the resurrection. All right, so Paul was preaching, we know, 12 years after the resurrection. And I love in that 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse, he said that um, he, he appeared to Cephas, okay, that um, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. How did he know that? Right. I mean, how did Paul know that Jesus appeared to Cephas? How did uh, Paul know that Cephas was a believer? Well, he tells us in another letter that he wrote to the church in Galatia, okay, the, the church, the the book's name is the book of Galatians. In the first chapter, beginning at verse 18, this is what Paul says. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and to stay with him for 15 days. Okay, I mean, first of all, look at the detail here. Right? Paul says after three years. So Paul came to faith, right? After three years, he went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, with Peter. And he stayed with him for 15 days. He said, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And I know some people are like, oh, Jesus had brothers? Yeah, I mean, James, he had brothers. He had uh, brothers and sisters. They were his half-siblings. And uh, so James was the brother of Jesus. Okay, and uh, um, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. James was not a disciple. There are two disciples named James. Right. But the brother of Jesus was not one of the disciples. Um, actually, the brother of Jesus did not come to faith until after Jesus rose from the dead. Um, I've said this before. And, you know, I've, got two, I've got two little yeah. sisters. Do you know what it would take for one of my little sisters to call me the Christ? <laughs> okay, I mean, do, do you know what I would have to do for one of them to believe that awesome. I was God and Abad kind of thing? You know, and, and so James did not believe that his brother Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ. It wasn't until after he rose from the dead that he came to faith. Hmm. And, and what's amazing is James, he became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And he was stoned for his faith. Wow. He was put to death for his faith. His yeah. brother. You know, his brother was. Yep, his brother was stoned in Jerusalem for his faith. You know, and so it, there's a lot packed in these little verses. Right? But if you really want me to, I mean, I see we got some excellent looking turkey over here. So we let's talk it. about that. There's more. <laughs> I, I mean, really I mean, that's that's to show it now. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm loving what you're yeah, doing. I, I, some I, I of the stuff you just don't get on Sunday yeah. mornings. Yeah. Do you want to try this trifle first? Yes. I always deserve I'm going to go with dessert. You know, what I love about this show, when we do this, it's like, this is the only time every week I get a home-cooked meal. I mean, this <laughs> is it right here. I'm kidding. I I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know that. Okay. Oop. I'm eating truffles. No, not not no, truffles. truffles. I, I know it's truffles. Truffles. I love it that it's, a, I love that you use the angel food cakes. You, they usually say to use a cake and then like a creme mm -hmm. glaze or a pudding mm -hmm. and a whipped cream and a fruit. Yes. And those are just beautiful colors it's together. It's so mm -hmm. eastery. And it's so light in calories, yep. yes. very pretty. It'll make the table look nice. Plus, it's easy. I love that. Yeah. I mean, and your and kids the the can day, do it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Just let, let them get free. Oh, yeah. You can even lay them on an angle, you know, and have it go. Oh, true. You know what I mean? You get artistic and, with it. Oh, look at that. And one thing glass. that you should do is make sure when you're filling the glass that everything is showing on the outside because that's very the pretty. pretty part. That is gorgeous. Yes, so, excellent. It's excellent. like art in a glass. Yeah, art in a glass. glass. And over here, Paul, this is the turkey. Now, I want you to take a picture. Take a piece there right off the anywhere that's those are the nuts, but that right there. See what you think. This is not your typical turkey that you're gonna serve with gravy. Mm -hmm. I've been basting it with uh, maple syrup and sriracha. Then I put a little brown sugar and butter on the top. Pretty good. Yes. We brined it. Mm -hmm. 
So it's got a little sweet it's beautiful. flavor to it. Is it yeah. juicy? Yes, it's excellent. It's excellent. It's and very juicy. Like the texture? I, I like the texture. I like the, uh, um, the, uh, the glaze on top. It's Isn't that nice yeah. too? It kind of makes you think of ham, yeah. right? Yeah, it does. Oh, it does. So good. change up your change up your holidays. I'm going to post the recipe for you. And it's, uh, I say you put nuts, you put pecans on half of it. Well, you have a happy day. Paula Dean does, um, she does, I'll post her recipe as well. It's outstanding. We did it in the air fryer. We did it up at one of her home um, when we were working on the cookbook. The only thing about putting the pecans on it, it's beautiful, but it's not as easy to cut. Mm -hmm. So I thought for tonight's show and for the pictures mm -hmm. afterwards, I just left them off to the side yeah. so that we can talk to it. It's like a praline and encrusted turkey breast that she does. It's excellent. Right. It's excellent. It's excellent. It's excellent. Yeah. 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 Very good. You know, I, I have so much here from this the one little verse that I, I want to share with you, okay? Because there's more. All right, a lot of New Testament scholars, um, once again, believers and atheists, okay, so it's not just Christians. These are New Testament scholars. They'll say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that there's a creed that's there. Mm -hmm. Now, a creed is just a, a very simple statement of belief. Right. Um, you, we all know a creed. If you go to church on a regular basis, we say we've got three ecumenical creeds, the Apostles, the Athanasian, and the Nicene Creed, right. okay, which you just memorize it. It's a simple statement of belief. Um, if you're not in church all the time, you know what? You still know a creed. You know, or a, you know well, yeah, well, yeah. Or how about ABCs? A, yeah. B, C, D, E, F, G. You yeah. know, and it's got a rhythm to it. And it's got a, you know, when we use that to teach kids who can't read how to read, right? Mm -hmm. And so a creed, you got to remember, in the first century, only about 10 to 15% of the people could read. Okay, we're, we're literate. And so what they did is they used creeds in order to teach people. Just like we use the ABCs. Mm -hmm. Yes, they could memorize like it. And they could teach it. Okay, and so they believe that here in this 1 Corinthians 15 that there's a creed there. And this creed predates Paul. And the creed is simply this. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. Okay, and if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 7, you can see it right there. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. Okay, and, and that creed, as I said, predates Paul. And so when Paul says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Now, part of what he passed on was this creed that people in the city of Jerusalem were already professing. Okay, and this is right after the resurrection. Okay, and people were professing this creed. So when you look at Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians, okay, does Paul's letter prove the resurrection? Well, no, not really. Okay, but what Paul's letter does show us is that Paul's letter is evidence that people in Jerusalem who saw Jesus die believed that Jesus rose again from the dead. Okay, so people who witnessed it with their own eyes believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul's letter proves that the resurrection was not just a product of oral transmission that took place decades after the event, right? I mean, it was there right from the very start. I mean, the number of Christians that grew, or the, the population of Christians that grew in Jerusalem, grew over 10 times in a matter of days after the resurrection. That there were 5,000 believers. Um, in the population of Jerusalem, it was only about 50,000 people at that point in time. Okay, so more and more people were coming to faith. And Paul's letter, Paul's letter proves that belief in the resurrection was documented even while eyewitnesses were still living. Okay, you know, he's, he challenged people, many of whom are still alive. Go and talk to them. Okay, and, and was Paul a liar? You know, I mean, that's what some people say. But some people say Paul was crazy, right? But once again, there's no scholar out there that, that would agree with that. No reputable scholar that would agree with that. Some people say, you know, Paul was lying. But if you really look at it, Paul's life validated what he believed. Right. Paul's life validated what he was teaching. Um, just real quick, Paul was a Roman citizen. Right. right? So he had special rights. Paul was extremely well-educated. He was actually taught by one of the great rabbis, the male. All right, so I mean, he was climbing the corporate ladder. He had a lot of influence. He had a lot of authority and power. Paul was a Pharisee, so he was one of the religious leaders of the day, and he was persecuting the Christian church. Yes. All right, yeah, I mean, he was climbing that ladder. He was a man well beyond his years, and in an instant, Paul gave it all up. He walked away from it. I mean, he got kicked out of the synagogue. He gave up the money. He gave up the influence. He did these three missionary journeys where his life was endangered. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was snake bitten. I mean, he gave up. He gave up. You know, all this authority and power for that. Yeah, all that privilege for for what he lived with and, and what he experienced. He and so, yeah. I mean, his 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 uh, 
his uh, life validates what it is that he believed and what it was that he taught. And so here's what I want you to walk away with today, right? Okay, the Bible did not invent Christianity. Christians did not invent Christianity. It was an event. It was an event, something that took place. Only the resurrection could validate it. Only the resurrection could give courage to those first century Christians. You gotta remember Peter and John, right? Okay, Peter and John once, I real quick, they, he, they healed a lame man, all right? So this guy was 40 years old, he had been lame, could not walk, not like a lame teacher, you know, he <laughs> like, couldn't walk, all right? Yeah, like, like my children are lame, no, not that kind of lame. Um, uh, oh, I got another one for you. What do you call a rabbit with fleas? <laughs> a rabbit? A rabbit with fleas. What do you call a rabbit with fleas? Come on, come on, come on. Bugs funny. Oh. Um, okay. Anyway, so so he wasn't he wasn't lame. Or, I'm sorry, wasn't lame like my jokes. He was lame, like could not walk, right? And so Paul and uh, uh, who uh, Peter and John, Peter and John. Peter and John, they healed this guy, and and uh, um, they got caught. All right, so they did it, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are holding Peter and John accountable because they did it on the Sabbath, and uh, um, they they arrested Peter and John. They pulled them in front of the very same people that crucified Jesus. You know, Annas and Caiaphas and the whole gang is there. The same people who just a few weeks earlier crucified Jesus are now accusing Peter and John. Okay, and they're calling them out. And they said to Peter and John, by what power or by what name did you do this? Okay, and Peter and John, this is what they respond. This is in Acts chapter 4, verse 10. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. I mean, think about that. Okay, the same people that crucified Jesus. Peter and John are standing in front of them, and they said, whom you crucified, that was where you put him to death, mm -hmm. but whom God raised from the dead. Okay, just a couple of weeks after the resurrection. You know, and then they went on, they, they, they went on to preach. They said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And the scripture says, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were just ordinary, unschooled men, they were astonished, and they took note that they had been with Jesus. Oh, I mean, just think about that. Okay, I mean, just think about it. I mean, and so the Pharisees and Sadducees, they warned Peter and John not to do anything, not to be teaching or preaching anymore, and the, um, they didn't listen. No. I mean, I, I love it. <laughs> Peter and John replied, okay? I mean, do you remember this? Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. In other, way, in other words, we witnessed it. We witnessed it. You know, I, I just, I don't know, I love it because they saw Jesus die. Right. Okay, they saw Jesus crucified and later, cruelly. yes, cruelly. <laughs> and later they ate breakfast with their friend on the seashore of the Sea of Galilee. And the, uh, Peter and John, Paul, all of those guys, none of them would be scared. No. Because you cannot scare somebody who's not afraid of death. Mm. Okay, and all of the disciples, including Paul, all of the disciples and the brother of Jesus, Jesus, all of them were put to death with the exception of one, John. John was the only one to live the old age. James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death in Jerusalem. Others were filleted like a fish. Others were crucified. Others mm. were speared to death. Okay, but you cannot scare men and women who don't fear death. And when you look at Jesus eye to eye, and you saw Jesus say, I am the resurrection and the truth, no one, or, uh, uh, the, the one who believes in me will live even though he dies. And when you see, when you look at Jesus and you see that and you hear that eye to eye and face to face, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. That's Easter. That is Easter. It's not some myth. It's not just the product of oral transmission. It's the truth. He is it's risen. the truth. He is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen. Yay. You've got to try. Look at okay, how try gorgeous this looks. Absolutely. They gorgeous. look like I yellow know. peaks, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> I know you hate peaks. He loves them. I don't. Oh, that's excellent too. Isn't that mm -hmm. outstanding? I mean, that's so different. Essentially, that is medicine, which yeah. I know that sounds terrible, but it tastes delicious. It's gorgeous. People spend it. Look at yes. money on supplements. When you're using spices and herbs mm -hmm. in your food, you're absorbing them in a way that your body can. To, can manage love them that. instead of buying it in buying yeah. Yeah. supplements. Yeah. But it's so pretty too. Mm -hmm. I love the beautiful um, desserts. I love the cauliflower, the Easter bread, the eggs, yes. the turkey. We've changed things up, but the main thing is the truth is always the same. No matter That's what right. you're serving, That's right. he has risen. He has risen. Right. And this Easter, we want you to celebrate with your families. You can 
keep the tradition, do something a little bit different, but you never forget the truth. He is risen. And all of this right here, this was fantastic, except Thank for those double eggs. <laughs> those double eggs. No, but that's just me. I'm just not an egg guy. <laughs> all right. Hey, just one more thing I want you to think about. Okay. I just want to take this with you. And uh, one more thing. Is very profound. Joke? Very profound. Okay. Yeah. What do you call 10 rabbits marching backwards? <laughs> Anybody? What do you call 10 rabbits marching backwards? I can't. A receding hairline. <laughs> I know some of you out there didn't think that was funny, but I do. All right. Hey, anyway, thank you for joining us. You have a great day. God bless and live love. See you real soon.